Chapter Two of The Life of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich. Chapter Two. Franklin gives up eating meat. His economy of time. Studies arithmetic. James Franklin establishes a newspaper. Benjamin writes for it. His brother is imprisoned. Benjamin manages the paper. Leaves his brother. Goes to New York. Sails thence to Philadelphia. Anecdote of the Dutchman. When about sixteen years of age, Franklin happened to meet with a book that recommended a vegetable diet. He determined to adopt it. His brother, being unmarried, did not keep house, but boarded himself and his apprentices in another family. By refusing to eat meat, Franklin occasioned a good deal of inconvenience, and he was frequently chid for his singularity. He accordingly learned the manner of boiling potatoes and rice, and of making hasty pudding, and then proposed to his brother if he would give him, weekly, half the money he paid for his board to board himself. His brother instantly agreed to it, and Franklin soon found that he could save half of what he received. This was a new fund for buying books. But this was not the only advantage. When his brother and the apprentices had gone to their meals, he was left in the printing office alone. He immediately dispatched his slight repast, which was often no more than a biscuit, or a slice of bread and a handful of raisins, or a tart from the pastry cooks, and a glass of water, and had the rest of the time till their return for study. By being thus economical of his time, he was able to make considerable progress in his books. He now began to feel the want of a knowledge of figures, and was once very much mortified by his ignorance of them. As he had entirely failed of learning them at school, he took Cocker's Arithmetic, and went through the whole of it by himself with the greatest ease. The mortification he had met with induced him to make great exertions, and we can succeed in anything to which we give our earnest attention. While he was intent on improving his language and style, Franklin met with an English grammar, at the end of which were two little sketches on the arts of rhetoric and logic. The latter of these finished with a dispute in the manner of Socrates, a very famous philosopher of Greece. Franklin was charmed with this modest and artful manner, and cured himself of the tricks of contradiction and too much positiveness. These habits were very disagreeable, and no one should allow himself to fall into them. In fact, if you wish to instruct others, says Franklin, a positive and dogmatical manner in advancing your sentiments may occasion opposition and prevent a candid attention. If you desire improvement from others, you should not at the same time express yourself fixed in your present opinions. Modest and sensible men who do not love disputation will leave you undisturbed in the possession of your errors. In adopting such a manner, you can seldom expect to please your hearers or obtain the concurrence you desire. In the year 1720 or 21, James Franklin began to print a newspaper. It was the second that appeared in America, and was called the New England Current. The only one before it was the Boston Newsletter. Some of his friends endeavored to dissuade him from the undertaking. They thought it would not succeed, as, in their opinion, one newspaper was sufficient for all America. There are now in the United States alone over 800 newspapers. The undertaking, however, went on. Benjamin assisted in setting the types, helped to print off the sheets, and was then employed in carrying the papers to the subscribers. Several men of information and talents wrote little pieces for the paper, which were amusing and gained considerable credit. These gentlemen often visited the printing office. Hearing their conversations and their accounts of the praise their pieces received from the public, Benjamin was excited to try his fortune among them. He was afraid, however, as he was still a boy, his brother would object to print anything of his composition in the paper. It was necessary, therefore, to disguise his handwriting, and to send his piece to the office in such a way that it should not be known from whom it came. When his friends came in, James showed them the communication from an unknown writer. They read it, praised it, and made several guesses as to the author. 
In these guesses, none were named but men of some character for talents and learning. They never once suspected it was written by the little printer's boy who stood at their elbows, chuckling in silence over the secret. Encouraged by the success of this attempt, he continued to write, and send other pieces in the same way to the press. He kept his secret as long as he saw fit, and then confessed himself the author of the writings they had been so long guessing about. Benjamin now began to be more noticed by his brother's acquaintance, which made him a little vain and led to some serious difficulties. His brother, notwithstanding the relationship between them, considered himself as master, and Benjamin as his apprentice, and accordingly expected the same services from him that he would from another. In some of these services the young printer felt himself degraded and thought that he should receive greater indulgence. His brother was passionate and frequently beat him, and finding the apprenticeship exceedingly tedious, Benjamin was looking forward for an opportunity to shorten it. This at length happened in a very unexpected manner. One of the pieces in the paper, on some political subject, gave offense to the assembly, one of the most important branches of the government of Massachusetts. James Franklin was taken up, censured, and imprisoned for a month, because he would not discover the author. Benjamin was also called up and examined before the council, but considering him as an apprentice who was bound to keep his master's secret, they dismissed him without punishment. During his brother's confinement, Benjamin had the management of the paper and indulged in very smart remarks upon the government. This pleased his brother, though it made others look upon him in an unfavorable light as a youth who had a turn for satire and libeling. The discharge of the imprisoned printer was accompanied with an order that James Franklin should no longer print the newspaper called the New England Current. On a consultation held at the printing office, it was proposed to change the name of the paper, and in this manner elude the order of the council. As there were many difficulties in the way of this project, it was determined to let the paper for the future be printed in the name of Benjamin Franklin. When apprentices are bound out, it is usual to have certain agreements drawn up between them and their masters, sealed and signed according to certain forms required by law. These papers are called indentures, James was afraid that the censure of the assembly would fall on him, as still printing the paper by his apprentice, and contrived that his old indenture should be returned to Benjamin, with a discharge on the back of it. This was to be shown only in case of necessity, and in order to secure his services for the remainder of the time, it was agreed that Benjamin should sign new indentures. These were to be kept private. This was a very flimsy scheme, but the paper continued to be printed in this manner for several months. At length, fresh difficulties arose, and Benjamin determined to take advantage of his discharge, thinking that his brother would be afraid to produce the new indentures. It was unfair to take this advantage, but he was urged to it by very unkind and even cruel treatment. When his brother found out his intentions, he went round to every master printer in town to prevent his getting employment. In consequence of this, he concluded to remove to New York, that being the nearest place where there was another printer. His father opposed his removal, and took side with his brother in the dispute. Benjamin sold his books to furnish the means of paying his passage, went privately on board of a sloop, had a fair wind, and in three days found himself in New York, three hundred miles from home, at the age of seventeen. There was no one in the place whom he knew. He was without any recommendations, and had very little money in his pocket. By this time he had entirely lost all his love for the sea, or he might have been induced to gratify it. Having another profession, and considering himself a good workman, he offered his services to a printer of the place, old Mr. W. Bradford. This man had been the first printer in Pennsylvania, and had removed from there in consequence of a quarrel with the governor, General Keith. He had a sufficient number of workmen, and little to do, and could give Franklin no employment. But, he said, my son at Philadelphia has lately lost his principal hand, Aquila Rose, by death, and if you go thither, I believe he may employ you. Philadelphia was one hundred miles farther, but Franklin concluded to go there. In crossing the bay, a squall struck the little vessel he was in, and tore her rotten sails to pieces. She was driven upon Long Island. On the way, a drunken Dutchman, who was a passenger in the boat, tumbled overboard. As he was sinking, 
Franklin reached out and caught him by a very bushy head of hair, and drew him up again. This sobered him a little, and he went to sleep, having first taken a book out of his pocket, which he desired Franklin to dry for him. It proved to be a Dutch copy of his old favorite book, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and he carefully complied with the wish of the sleepy owner. End of chapter 2